Jason. Vortex. 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 So Chris, during lockdown and with all the COVID restrictions, how have you been um, keeping on keeping yourself busy? I really good, thanks. Um, just been busy, really, really busy. Uh, last year was sort of the season was sort of not cancelled, but it was sort of put off from sort of starting at April time and it sort of kicked off in August time. And uh, it sort of felt like from April to August we'd done nothing. Then from August to November it was just absolutely crazy. Um, and with that running so late and with, with that running so late in the year to November, it sort of meant that the off season wasn't as long as what it normally is. Mm -hmm. um, trying to get deals over the line, trying to get sponsorship sorted out. It all seemed like a bit of a rush. Um, and I suppose in one way it actually was good because it meant that everybody knew that it was we were running in a condensed time frame to try and get everything all put together. And I think it actually in some ways maybe helped us put some deals together because people knew we needed a decision sort of there and then. Um, and thankfully we sort of got all our deals sort of in line, sort of January, February time. And that sort of let us concentrate on getting ready to go racing, you know. Um, obviously, it's my second year in the car and second year of the team. But it's really the first time that we've had an opportunity to go testing and change things and have a look at it and see exactly what we were doing. Last year, as I say, was, we brought it out and done the media day and we were thrown into the first race weekend. And a lot of the times we were guesting and we weren't able to you know, say exactly what we needed from the car and what we needed to do. But <clears throat> sort of this year, we've, it's given us an opportunity where we can, um, where we have been able to go test and we've been able to try things, able to change things. And obviously I've got a new teammate now, Tom Ingram, and the two of us working together, it's really enabled us to bring the car forward, a massive step forward, you know, and it's, uh, the car is really something now. It is really, really good. It's a very competitive car now. Well, uh, we... Each week we have a, a news round up and, and um, I know in the first round I uh, followed it at Thruxton, um, probably frustrating as one word, disappointing is probably another in the three races that you, you started. So you had two DNFs from right and centre and you finished 15 in the third race. Um, so what what's your thoughts on that, Chris? I suppose it, it's not ideal, but... Um, you know what, what? What do you take from from that meeting? Uh, what what positives can you take from it going into the next race um, yeah. at Snerdon? If we'd have had any more luck at Thruxton, would have broke down on the way home. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, we were fast all weekend. We were comfortably inside the top ten all weekend. You know, uh, Jason Pluto qualified behind me, and he left Thruxton third in the championship. You know that sort of says it all. You know, we 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 were faster. You know than the Vauxhalls all weekend and. It, it's the pace is there everything's all there and everything that went wrong at Thruxton was out of my control you know if I if I make a mistake or I throw it off or I do something wrong I'm the first person to put my hands up to say listen that was my fault I made a mistake you know Gordon Shedden was a little bit impatient on the first lap behind Ollie Jackson he got stuck into him around Noval the two of them went off and Gordon came back across the road and steamed into the side off me at 120 miles an hour you know, there's nothing that, and I've watched it back 30 times to see if there's anything I could have done any different to, to try and avoid that incident. And no matter what angle I look at it from, and I've spoke to many people about it, and I, at that point I was a passenger at that stage. And, you know, with the car getting damaged that heavily at the start of the day, the rest of the day is, a, you know, it, it, it makes the rest of the day hard. You, you end up spending the rest of the day fixing things on the car that are not right after an incident race one. You know, I think we came from last. 15th in race two at one point and uh you know we would have been we would have been, we would have got ourselves into the reverse grid draw there's no doubt about that i think there was nine laps to go you know before the car it, it showed a glitch with the it showed that the temperature went above where we can run the engine and it showed that the oil temperature going above where we were where, where we can run the engine okay and uh you know whenever you're in sort of 15th place you don't really risk an engine for 15th place and i and i slowed down when we came back into the pit lane but it actually was a was electronic glitch in the car that that showed that showed that the temperature reading one thing and the actual temperature was another thing you know but that's a result of race one the car getting damaged uh race three um we started from the back again uh, everyone put wets on, which you couldn't believe because the track actually was dry at that point in time. We, we kept the mix on. Um, yeah, the car was going really, really good. Got the seventh place and then the heavens opened again. 
So it's just about, it really is a case of luck and being in the right place at the right time, that seems to be for the British Touring Car Championship was concerned. Yeah, it's one of those things, you know, your day can be turned upside down instantly. You know, you can you can be qualifying near the front somewhere and all of a sudden you get you caught up in someone else's incident. That's, that ruins your whole weekend. But yeah, the positives are our bad weekends out of the way. Uh, moving forward, we know we've got a fast car. Um, yeah, we're going to Snedderton, not carrying any weight. So, if, you know, a good ball fan of Snedderton is definitely on the cards. And do you think we can really try and get your, I know it's early, early days, but can you get your championship back on track at Snedderton? Is that a track you particularly enjoy? Absolutely. Well, listen, there's people winning that championship and there's some weekends on their worst weekends that don't score any points. So there's no reason why we can't get ourselves back up to where we need to be. You know, this year we want to be in the top five and six of that championship and that comes at the end of the year you're in the lottery for the overall thing. So that's really what we're working towards this year. You know, consistent points every weekend and, you know, if there's a big result to be taken, we're going to take it. So that's that's exactly what we're looking for this year. And you said to me pre-season that um, having the same car beneath you for the second consecutive year is actually a, a bit of a blessing because I know you've... You've maybe had the same team for uh, back-to-back years, but you've had a different car. So how important is it to have the same car beneath you for um, a second season rather than chopping and changing all the time, Chris? Hey, well, it's, it's, this, this championship's so close and it's so competitive now. You know, it's, there's tenths of a second separating the top ten. You know, you know, the difference between first and tenth sometimes is less than half a second. And from first to thirtieth is less than a second. So... You're looking for minimal gains everywhere and to be in the same car and to be in the same team and be comfortable with the surroundings that surround me. And also I brought my old engineer back from um, my previous team before. Uh, that, that, that's all those little things all account for a massive, you know, it makes a massive difference in this championship because you're, you're competing against 30 of the most competitive pe- drivers in the UK. You know, you're competing against all the top teams. You're competing against, you know, manufacturer teams. Um, yeah, all the small details make a massive difference. You know, you're not going to find one little setup change. You're going to find a massive amount of time. It's it's four or five small things, a little bit here, a little bit there. And that's that's what really makes a difference in this championship and consistency and reliability and all those things. It's, you know, it's it's so unforgiving. You know, it's it's so so competitive and it's so unforgiving. That, yes, everyone does have a bad weekend. But as I said, we, we have had our bad weekend. You know, we've another nine weekends to look forward to now, and we know we've got a fast car underneath us. Um, so yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to the remaining bit of the season. And I read in the press that uh, Accelerate Motorsport has really tried to improve this car and, and move things forward. But what areas, um, having driven it at Thruxton, do you think that the, the game has been moved on in terms of, uh, you know, comparing it to last season to the start of this season? From where we left off last year, from where it is now to the start of this year, uh, there's very, very little of it exactly the same. We've made lots of little changes in lots of areas. Um, you know, the car's undergone uh, a bit of a facelift at the front end. It's it had, had a little bit of aerodynamic work done to it. Um, the, the, the setup changes throughout the suspension and the dimensions and all of that little, little bits and pieces have all been changed on the car. You know, there's no, there's not one key area where, where they've worked on. It's been an overall change in all in, in lots of different areas. Do you understand me? The rules yeah, don't. Yeah. The rules, the rules in the BTCC, you, you can't, you can't change. Say, for instance, the type of spring you run or the type of damper you run. Everyone has to run a set type of suspension in the car, um, and it's how you set that up and how you adapt to that. That's that's where you can make the difference. Um, but we've made lots of little different changes throughout the whole car. Um, it's very, very hard to pinpoint one area where it's made a massive change. It's just been an overall update on the whole car. And it's, I have to say, it's it's a different machine from what it was this time last year. The definitely, from what we can gather, your your belief in the car, you, you're somebody who's never doubted your own uh, capabilities, but certainly with this car below you, you, you definitely feel that this, um, could be not a breakthrough season, but a season where you get the chance to really show um, fans and, and people who follow the, the follow the series from a commercial point of view what you're capable of, Chris. 
absolutely yeah you know i've i have a lot of sponsors who have stayed with me over the years and have got new ones that came on board with us and uh you know we don't go to make up the numbers you know i've, I've been racing since i've been seven years of age uh we've been around motorsport our whole lives we live for this this is not something that we do as a hobby we take this deadly seriously i get up three mornings a week at half five in the morning going training to, to keep fit to go racing you know we we don't we don't take this for granted this is something that we take very seriously and um if you look at my season's performances before, you know, we've always been there or thereabouts, but maybe luck hasn't been on my side in quite a number of times. Um, mm -hmm. I've learned a lot about racing in the BTCC, about finishing races. And yeah, I think this year is going to be a year where, we, where we're going to be consistently in the mix and we're going to be at the front and uh, yeah, take a few race wins. That, that, would be, that would be a great payback for all the sponsors and everyone who's stuck with me and also the team for letting me stay with them for a second year. And Chris, you, you, you touched there on the fact of um, not to cut across Jason there, but needing a bit of luck to win a championship. And I find that interesting because um, earlier on today, I was actually watching a piece of footage with um, Taron McKenzie from the British Superbike Championship. And he, he said the exact same thing. You know, you can have the best bike or the best car or and the best team around you, but you also need a wee bit of luck to get you over the line, and I suppose that's something you would definitely agree with. I yes, but it's championships are won on the worst days you have, not on the best days. You know, the person who has the least worst days at the end of the year turns out to be the champion. It's not that's your 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 championships decided on the bad days you have, you know, and it's how you come back from them, and it's how you how you adapt to, you know, if you've had a, a bad qualifying session or you've had a, you've been taken out in race one, it's how you come back from that and how you get yourself back up again. Because listen, the other guys will have bad days. You know, there's days where a car will spin off across the front of them or they'll have a mechanical problem or for whatever reason, anything can happen in this championship. It's so close, it's so competitive. Um, it's inevitable that there's going to be a bit of action here and there. And there's some days where someone's misfortune helps you and there's other days where your misfortune helps them um yeah and it's it's paramount that you finish races it's so so important that you finish races even if it's only a few points you're lifting um it's so so important because this this championship honestly it is so close it's it's scary how close it is now it's so so competitive how difficult is it to retain a seat in the british touring car championship Chris? obviously money has a big part to play but when you line up each each time for a race, is there anywhere in the back of your mind thinking I need to do well because there are these people who've invested in me? Is there a whole myriad of um, feelings and emotions, not just about the, the media here and now of the race, but you know, after the race, if I don't finish it, I maybe have to explain to this guy why I didn't finish it. You know, can you talk us through that process, please? The BTCC is a pressure cooker. You know, once from the minute you sign up from the start of the year till the season's over, you know, or, or not even until the season's over, one, once you're involved in this, this is, a, this is a machine that never switches off. You know, this runs 365 days a year. You know, this is, yes, you've got 10 race weekends and you've got probably the same amount of test days again. Um, but this is a machine that never switches off. You know, this is, this is something that has to be fed every day. And yes, the commercial partners and sponsors that the team have without them without doubt we wouldn't be racing um so yes you know there is a certain bit of pressure there which i think is good you know i think it's a, a good pressure um it's it's one of those things that you know whenever you've had a good weekend you can repay them for the, for the bad weekends you know and it, it's it's one of those things that if you put yourself under too much pressure, you know, saying I must win and I must do that, that's whenever it doesn't come. You know, you normally tend to find that your results and your good weekends come whenever, not that you're not under pressure, but you're relaxed and, you know, you, you've got that little bit of belief that you can do it. I, I just wanted to ask as well, do you think your best years, um, you obviously have a BTCC tends to have, have um, the window for, for people to compete in, it seems to be quite quite large. Do you still feel that your best years are ahead of you, Chris? 
because you look at people like Colin Turkmenton, um, you look at your Matt Neil, okay, he's not competing this year. Um, you look at Jason Plato, who you mentioned, Gordon Shedden. I mean, those are all kind of the, the old guard of the sports. Do you see you and the sport going forward having a long uh, association, as it were, a long relationship? Absolutely, yeah. This this is one of these things that, you know, it builds on year. You know, that you never you never see that someone who just jumps into the BTCC and wins the season for the first year and the won the championship and they clear off and they do it again. You normally find that it takes people three, four, five, six, seven, eight years to really establish themselves in the championship, you know, and that's that's due to how, how competitive and, and, you know, how tough it is. Um, it's it's one of those things that the more you, the more times you do it, the more experience you have, there's, there's just little situations that you can get yourself into in this. And there's days where you go for it there's days where you have 75 kilos on the hard tire. You ain't going to win that race. You know, you need to finish. You need to finish and take points. You know, there's so many different things that, you know, that you have to be aware of. You know, there's, there's championships out there, but talk about GT racing. You know, you could be in a car that's half a second lap faster than all the other cars on the grid. You know, you don't, you don't have the same decisions that you have to make. Um, there's, there's, as you said earlier, there's, there's lots of guys in the championship. Jason Plato's, Gordon Shedden's, Matt Neal's have been there for a long, long time and have a, a wealth of experience. But I think as you've seen the last sort of two or three years, the guard has sort of changed slightly to the younger generation now, you know. Um, you can definitely see that there's the new generation is coming through. And, you know, there's some of these guys like myself have sort of got five years experience in the championship now and they can bring a lot to the table. You know, they're maybe not in the most experienced teams out there, but, you know, if you, if you look at me and Tom Ingram as a pairing, there's not many other pairings up and down the grid that are as strong as that. You know, there's plenty of teams that have got one maybe championship winner and the, the second driver might be n- n- not, not a slow driver, but a less experienced driver. Um, I think if you look at me and Ingram as a, as a team pairing, I've got five years experience and I think Tom has... has seven years experience in the championship you know there, there, there's 12 years between the two of us that, that we can bring to the team and each time the two cars run we're bringing back sets of data that we know that we can work on improve on i mean i have the car in a window that small changes is finding us what we need to find you know and okay that, that is the difference between a championship contending team and a team that can win an odd weekend or you know, it's the, the two driver, the two having a team with two strong drivers really is a big advantage. Just want to ask a couple of quick questions. And I know Arne has, wants to touch more about your your family's connection with two wheels. Um, next year, 2022, there is regulation changes coming into the Touring Car Championship. If, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so we're looking at hybridization for next year. Is that correct? I guess. What is your your views on that? Uh, is it as a good move, Chris, or should maybe the sport have, have taken a different approach to moving forward? No, the word the words of fast change in place, you know. And whenever you switch the TV on now, you see all different types of car companies. They're not trying to sell you a TDI car anymore or a diesel car anymore. They're going down the route of petrol hybrids, electric, all these types of things, you know. And that is whether you like it or whether you don't like it, that is the way the motor the motor game is going. Um, and I think that it's extremely important that the BTCC follow that route because lots of these companies now that are involved with, with partners and sponsors, a lot of their company mottos and logos and things now are all about, you know, green, green uh, you know, fuel saving, carbon neutral, all these types of things. And that, and that is hot news now. Um, and I think as a marketing point of view for the championship, I think it's very, very important that they have went down that route um, for it to be the first touring car championship in the world to have adapted hybrid into their rules. I think it's very, very important as well. Um, the interesting bit's going to be that there, there's, there's, there's different ways that the hybrid system's going to work. Um, there's been talk of that they're going to remove the ballast from the cars. Okay. And... So basically what they're going to do is um, the car has a set amount of hybrid power for the race. So say, for example, a, a stat, this is only a figure. This, is, this, is, this might not even be 
an accurate figure. Say you've got a minute's worth of hybrid power over a 25 minute, a 25 lap race. Mm -hmm. If you win race one, you might only get 30 seconds worth. And they'll, they'll penalize the cars in that way. So you'll have less amounts of hybrid power over the race. Um, I think that's a route that they're actually looking at at the minute. Um, or the other one might be that we still continue on with the weight and we still have the, the hybrid power. That just hasn't been decided yet, but I think it's going to make the racing very, very interesting. And I think it's and going to be around. I think it's going to be around fifty horsepower extra. The cars are going to have as well, whenever right. you're on. The so it's going. To, it is going to make it very interesting. Just, um, I know Aaron's itching to get in, and I will let him in just a wee sec. But I wanted to I just expand on. Very sick waiting on you. I know. I know. My, my heart bleeds for him. Um, I wanted very quick to expand on the, the intricacies of this new hybrid system. So can you tell us and the listeners a little bit more, is it a mild hybrid system? Is it a plug-in hybrid system? What way does it work, so, Chris? So the all, all hybrid car systems are, it's an electric motor assisting the engine. So, so this, this hybrid system will sit in the passenger side of the car. And, it, whenever, and whenever I hit the button on the dash or on the steering wheel, to, 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 to knock on the hybrid system power, the electric motor will send 50 horsepower to the gearbox, and that will give the car that amount of power for every length of time I use the hybrid button. And obviously, whenever the car breaks, and whenever you coast, it will recharge again through through the wheels, and it will recharge into the battery again. Um, mm -hmm. Something quite similar to what Formula One have, actually. That's, that's, that's pretty much how their system works. Okay. You know, whenever you whenever you break and whenever you you coast, the, the hybrid system recharges through the, through through the wheels again. And do you have only so much energy per race, or is that uh, energy in that battery? Is that um, so? As I said, so as I said earlier, so if you're given a minute's worth of hybrid power, okay, you'll only be allowed to use a minute's worth. So you'll only be allowed to hold your finger on. So say it's ten seconds a lap, you're allowed to use hybrid power. You'll be able to use it for ten laps. Right, okay. that's, that's basically the type of thing. So if you win race one and you're given 30 seconds worth of hybrid power, you'll only be allowed to use it for that. that you'll, only, you'll only be allowed to use five seconds instead of using 10 seconds per lap. Do you understand me? Yeah, I okay, get you know, yeah. Do, yeah. do you understand me? So yeah. it'll be set, they'll be able to cap how long you can run the car with the boost on. Right. Just to make it even more interesting. Well, I think, I think what we're actually going to do as well is put LED lights on the windows. So it'll be able to count down how long you've got left with, with, with the, the system. Do you understand me? Yeah, yeah. So there'll be a, there'll be a countdown There'll be a countdown on the, the window of the car and it's some type of an LED and it'll tell you whereabouts the car is at that stage in the race. It's going to make it very I think it's going to make the, 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 the racing very, very interesting. It's going to be more strategic. Um. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to be, you know, what at what part of the track do you use it? You know, when do you use it? How do you use it? How long do you use it for? You know, I think it's going to add another level into the into the series. And M Sport up in Cumbria, they would have close affiliations with the World Rally Championship, the British Rally Championship. They have the Bentley uh, GT program. They they have won the the tender to build the Toka engine for twenty twenty two, and okay. given. Given them sports pedigree, would you expect more teams to turn to the Toka engine, or would you? I think at the moment it's fifty-five percent of the grid use the Toka engine, but would you expect that percentage to go up, given who it is that's building it, or would you expect it to remain the same? I would expect it to stay the same. I would expect it to stay exactly the same because the BMW runs its own engine, the Honda runs its own engine, um, who else builds it? I think I think it's only oh, and the Ford and the Ford, uh, the Mountain cars. I think they will actually. I'm not 100 percent sure whether Mountain's going to develop their own Ford engine or they're going to go to the M Sport engine. That that may be the only team that changes, um, because they you have to run the brand of engine that comes in the car, so they would actually be able to run the M Sport engine because it's derived from the Ford. Okay. So I'm, I'm not sure if that will change or not. I'm not. I'm not sure. Well, that's interesting. But um, Aaron, over to you. Chris, now that you and Jason have set the um, British Touring Car Championship to rights. I wanted to just ask you uh, a few questions about motorcycling, and I believe that there's a bit of a passion for it in your family as well. Maybe you could tell the listeners a little bit about that. I'm 
well, actually, you see, I'm actually, I'm actually still in work. Um, and this, you see, this showroom that we have in Carrie Fergus, even car sales in Carrie Fergus, it was actually built by Robert Joey, and uh, I can't remember the other brother's name. Um, Jim. Jim. They actually built this. They actually built this showroom back in the nineties for my dad. So they did. Um, they used to do steel erection, shed building stuff, and they actually built this shed that we, we have here now. Um, but yeah, my dad's been involved around bikes his whole life. Um, he used to, he represented Ireland in the, the Irish Six Days, so he did. Um, he, he competed, I think, four or five times for Ireland. Um, it's Six Days Motocross, you know, it's, or not, not motocross, but it's like enduro type riding. It's like mm-hmm. a, a rally raid type race. And he, I think he actually finished second in Poland. I can't remember what year it was. Um, but yeah, my dad had a good good career in the bikes. I think he was Irish motocross champion and various other things. But uh, yeah, whenever my dad retired, he basically had a, a bike racing team. Uh, he had a road racing team. And he had a circuit racing team. Uh, there's, I think they finished second in the TT. They won. Woolsey Coulter won six, seven Northwest two hundreds on my dad's bike. Um, Sam McClements won loads of races on my dad's bike. Um, there's so many other I can't remember all the names off the top of my head, but there's been so many guys that have been involved with with my dad through motorcycling through the years. Um, so yeah, it's for a, for a, a long, long time my dad was involved at a high level of bike racing in in UK and Ireland. And did that not brush off onto you at all? Obviously, you went for the four wheel route, so your passion lies there. Obviously, uh, well, I sort of think whenever I was five and six that my dad says I don't really fancy you on the two wheels. Um, he wanted to try and keep me off them. Um, he sort of pushed me down the go-karting route. Uh, I started racing carts in 2000. I think the last time Dad won, uh, Dad's team won the Northwest 200 it was 98, I think it was. Um, but yeah, no, Dad never pushed me on two wheels. He always tried to keep me off them. Um, you know, I, I love I love bike racing. I love watching it. But I don't fancy the injuries that come along with it. You know, I take my hat off to all the guys that compete at any type of uh, two-wheel motorsport. You know, it's... Um, they, they take their life in their hands every time they run one of those bikes, you know, even more so fit the road racing, you know, thankfully circuit racing now that sort of safened it up quite a bit. Um, you know, watched Johnny Ray there yesterday. I thought he was uh, very, I thought he was brilliant all weekend. Um, it's just, it's just sad at the minute that we can't get any road racing, you know, it's, it's a big part of the year, you know, and I love, I love going to the Northwest 200, love going to the Ulster Grand Prix. Um, you know, they're all great events that, you know, that Northern Ireland's associated with. Yeah, and you touched there on the fact of, you know, the two-wheel motorsport. You're obviously from Carrick Fergus, Alistair City country. Do you ever have any dealings with Alistair at all? Hi. Um, I don't know Alistair really well, but I've spoke to him quite a few times. Um, Alistair would go out on the trials. They, they all go out on trials bikes and at the weekends, and they would go out just up the road from me here, so they were where we live. Um, yeah, Alistair's a good guy, you know, very very successful at the Northwest 200. I think he's the, the I think he's the most successful rider ever at the Northwest 200. You know, um, you know to go to go there year on year and have so much success there. You know, it's um, it's real credit. You know, and Carrick Fergus as a whole. You know, the Irwins from are from Carrick Fergus as well. Um, you know, Carrick Fergus has a good pedigree, and obviously Johnny Ray is ten minutes from Carrick Fergus. He's Bally Clare, so this part of Andrum's uh, a pretty fast bit of it. <laughs> Well, where do you see your future going forward, Chris? Is it going to? Are you happy with sticking with the BTCC? I mean, every driver or rider has always loved the ambitions. Do you think the BTCC is 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 the one we'd like to stay going forward, or because I look at reading over your your history, you're well travelled and you've you've done a lot of one make series. You were over in Germany at one point with the Sirocco War Cup, um, and that obviously led to your your time in the BTCC. But what? How would you like to see your your future plan if you have a say in that well we want to stay where we are you know we've invested this much time and all the sponsors have invested this much money you know the, the btcc is where we want to stay you know it's um it's 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 hard to get into once you get in there it's hard to stay there and you see once you have that passion inside you and you you've been involved in those types of events it's very very hard you know whenever whenever the, the, the turn of the year comes every year the auto sports show 
is over, you know, everyone's ready to go racing and there's there's no other feeling like it coming to that first weekend, you know, with uh, a team of guys that are all behind you, all the sponsors are behind you, you know, and in normal times there's forty or fifty thousand people there watching you on a Sunday and it's all live on ITV. You know, there's nothing else can replace that. You know, it's um I, I feel very privileged that I've done it for five years. Um, you know, if it ended next week, I could always say, you know, I was a BTCC race winner and I've been on the podium I think ten times and been on the front row two or three times. Uh, yes, I want more out of it, but if it ended tomorrow, I could always look back at it and say, you know, I had a great time. That was, uh, it, it was something that it was a great thing to be involved in, you know. And it's, it's, it's something that where we are with it now, we're so close to being right at the very front of it. Um, you know, we're 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 at the point now where we've we've been in it long enough. We've got the right experience now that you know we're getting close where we can do the real business now. So. Um, yeah, I want to stay where we are. You know, it's um, I'm very thankful for obviously accelerate keeping me again. You know, silly season every year. It's very very easy to get lost. You know, within deals and maybe not, maybe something doesn't go your way. You know, I, I'm very thankful for them. That you know they've been very loyal with me. You know, they they helped me very well uh, with marketing and getting new sponsors on board. And and that is part of the the business that sometimes people don't really understand that motorsport is about that. The BTCC is a business. It's it's not a bit of fun that you turn up on a Saturday morning with your helmet. You, you turn up racing. You know it is, it is something that runs three hundred and sixty five days a year. You know there's people's livelihoods involved in it. You know all the guys that work in my car, they're 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 full time. You know so they're they get up they get up to work on a Monday morning and they're going into into the the workshops to try and make my car go faster. You know and this is a this is a deadly serious sport and. Um, yeah, it's a great thing to be part of. And at what point during your, I suppose your apprenticeship as a as a driver did you did you say to yourself the British Touring Car Championship is, is where I want to be? Because again, reading through your profile, you finished third in the BRDC Stars of Tomorrow in two thousand sixteen, and in the following year you were two thousand six. Sorry, I beg your pardon, two thousand six. Um, and in the following year you won a junior scholarship so that opened the door to the genetic junior championship so was that scholarship the moment that sort of gave you a taste of if i can get a bit of back and i can get my, my foot up the, the rung of the ladder that's really and prove what i'm capable of that might sort of open more doors to me not, not really if i'm being honest with you the genetic junior thing you know i was still quite young at that stage it was like 12 13 you know you switch the tv on on a sunday and you say to yourself how are you ever going to get into that? You know, and that and that's at that stage, that's where you are still with it. You know, uh, when did I ever think that I was going to get a chance? In two thousand and thirteen, I won the mini challenge JCW championship, and part of the prize for that year was, say you won, say you won race one, you you got a coupon, and that was put in the hat. So every time you won a race, your coupon was put in the hat. And I think there was 30 races that year. So obviously the more times you won a race, the more chances you had off the prize, which was a fully test, a fully funded day in Jason Plato's MG, which was a factory test with Triple Eight. Um, I think that year we won, I can't remember whether it was nine or 13 races. I can't remember the number now. It's quite a long time ago. Um, <laughs> Showing your age there, Chris. Uh, it's 10 years ago nearly now. <laughs> uh, I can't remember how many races we won, but anyway, we won the most races of the season, and the draw was actually done live on ITV4 during the lunch break of the of the, the touring car, you know, on ITV4. Yes. So I'm, I'm sitting at home watching, and I have no chance of winning this. I'm just sitting saying I'm not going to win this. And Ian Harrison, who was at that time, he was the team manager at at Triple Eight, and Anthony Williams I was walking down with this hat, and Ian Harrison pulls his, <laughs> pulls his, pulls this thing out of his hat. Chris Smiley, I, I was I won the full day's test at Silverstone. I said I couldn't believe it. I honestly couldn't believe it. And uh, you know, the next day I was sent through an email, you know, we're gonna be at Silverstone at such and such a date. You need to make sure you're there at nine o'clock or the, the test starts at nine, you need to make sure you're there for seven. You know, that day we that day we went there, you know, it was it was a great experience at that if, if you know to, to jump out of a, a mini Cooper S and the four hundred horsepower touring car. Yeah, you know, uh, whenever you're sort of 17, 18, it's a quite an experience. And um, Ian Harrison says at the end of the day, he says you weren't far away there. He says you were, you were pretty close. He says, 
to be honest, we don't have our second driver sealed up for next year. You know, if you can get X, you know, we would actually give you a go at this. Okay. You know, this was sort of like November time, which was quite late in the year. And we tried our best to try and get a deal put together and try and get something done. But unfortunately, we just didn't, we, we, it was too rushed and we, we didn't get anything put together. But it wasn't really until 2017 that we actually got the proper backing and everything all put together. But that test day said, it, it sort of gave you the belief that yes, you know, in the right opportunity with the right sponsors, yes, we could have a go at this, you know, and that was, that was really the sort of thing that, that was the sort of carrot dangling in the front office after the day we done that test. And um, do you think there's enough, uh, I asked this to last week's guest, Gary a lot, uh, a road racer, he's now retired, but I want to ask the same to you, do you, I think motorsport is a better place to to offer younger people scholarships and anniversaries. Is that something that there needs to be more of in terms of motorsport? Absolutely, absolutely. I think I think it's it's I think it's it's quite sad that you know if someone is good at playing football and they're dedicated, you normally find to get there in the end. And I think. I think with motorsport, you know, and it's it's quite hard it's quite hard to compare motorsport with football because you know you can go and buy a pair of football boots for whatever the cost. You know, to, to go motorsport at a high level now, you know, it's it's millions of pounds, you know, to run to run these high level cars now. But there's there's I think the problem is that with, with go karting now starting off kids at a young age, the amount of money that's being spent on a eight year old child is, is is wrong I think it needs to be I think this is one of the benefits I think that'll come from hopefully electric type racing I think if there's 30 go-karts with an electric engine in them I think everyone has the same opportunity yeah you know I think I think that's actually going to give young kids an opportunity and I think there should be some form of a series that there's a junior uh, a junior series and a senior series and the winner of that gets X. And if you win that, it gets you that. And if you win that, it gets you that. And that should there should be some form of a ladder that brings kids from seven years of age to sort of 15, 16, 17, 18 years of age, where you should be, if you're trying to move your career on, that there's a series that gives you that opportunity to step your way up the system. Yeah. As it stands at the minute, it's, it's quite hard to make that step up through the ranks. Well, if there's anyone listening from Motorsport UK, um, I think that's, I would definitely um, second what you said there, Chris. We need to really do as much as we can to encourage younger people with potential who maybe just aren't in as fortunate position as some people to, to get that little uh, kickstart that they need and, and show their potential because we do have a great pedigree of talent in, in the UK and Northern Ireland especially. And we just need to try and find that and nurture it. And uh, as you say, your neck of the woods isn't short and people who are successful and that just doesn't happen by chance. So um, it'd be good to get, get a bit more money into the sport and get more younger people involved, really. Oh, I know that. And there's, there's a guy in Carrick Fergus, a guy called Davy Mulligan. Um, he runs a little uh, motocross school. I think it's called Cornerstone um, Riding. It's like, a, it's like basically what it is. If, if you have a... This, this is for motocross, by the way. 